welcome back everybody best day of the week fundraisers friday with the amazing tony bell hello hey there happy friday it's so good to see you julia it's great to see you um i want to start today with just an update um you have you live in florida you work in florida um you know we've been following the trajectory of these storms um, and this is such a, a perilous time for our nonprofit sector of course folks that live there um, talk to us a little bit about what's been going on yeah well thank you for yeah thank you for acknowledging that and and bringing it up there are certainly a, a lot of folks in communities all across florida uh, that are dealing with tremendous devastation and and life-changing events uh, we were fortunate. I'm in South Florida, so I am in like the Broward County, Dade County, you know, Miami, Fort Lauderdale area. Uh, we were actually spared both times uh, and, and feeling very grateful and very blessed uh, for that. And as a result, uh, you know, a lot of our community members here have been collecting supplies, uh, mm -hmm. waited until there was the all clear and have been driving up to other communities in Florida to help support them either, you know, just with household essentials or food uh, or just sweat. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I've seen a lot of that happening in, in my community where folks are, are taking the lead and, and gathering items and, and again, driving them there or shipping them there. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm certainly seeing a, a lot of nonprofits that have chapters kind of across the state and how the chapters in, in the areas that were not affected are again rallying together uh, to help support their team members uh, in chapters in those communities where they no longer have a home. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's, it's what we see a lot, uh, not just in the US, but around the, the globe, is that when these events take place, communities really do come together despite all other odds or obstacles right. uh, that that we create uh, to to help their their neighbor. Well, you know, Tony, thank you for letting me put you on the spot. I know that we were talking in the green room about your leadership uh, with your local AFP chapter and how there are several chapters in, in um, you know, Florida. Um, and I just got to believe that as you all start to navigate forward, you're going to be hearing more and more about this and um, the need and, and the shared, um, I don't know, involvement, right? Like, you know, just getting involved. And so, uh, you know, thank you for giving us that that heads up because this is, a, wow, what an incredible thing. Um, mm -hmm. And, and really frightening. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, today on Fundraisers Friday, we're gonna be talking about turning a donor frown upside down. I know. And you know, I don't think we talk enough about this. I think we're always like, oh, happy donors, right? You know, and it's like, mm, we need to maybe be thought more thoughtful about this. So it's gonna be really an interesting conversation. Awesome. You know, another interesting conversation that we have every day are our amazing sponsors, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, of course, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. These are the folks that support us day in and day out. I'm Julia C. Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm joined today by the amazing Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy. Um, a true thought leader um, in our sector about fundraising, um, managing relationships um, throughout our nonprofit sector with donors and stakeholders and what that looks like. And um, this is one of my true joys is to get to have time with you, Tony, to learn from you and with you about these these topics that are so very important. So, Thank you for joining us. Okay. Now we got to get to this quickly because I have a lot of questions for you. Okay. Why would anyone have an issue with their nonprofit? Like, why would they be unhappy? Yeah, right. What's there to frown about? I mean, I'm I'm supporting a great cause and and they're doing great work. And uh, 
yeah, so so why should I, you know, have any frown at all? Uh, yeah. You know, when when I what I'm doing is is meant to feel so good. Uh, I I will say, starting our conversation today, Julia, I made a lot of notes. <laughs> so you you may see me reflecting on some of my notes today, which is a little uncommon for me. But I wanted to make sure that uh, again we kind of hit on all of these areas that are really important when we talk about you know turning a donor frown upside down, and uh, and I think part of part of the equation in terms of, of knowing what to do when a donor is unhappy is, is understanding what makes them unhappy. And there are different ways that that takes place. And, and one of them, of course, is that donor that you have that awesome relationship with that isn't afraid to just call you, text you, email you, and say, I'm unhappy. <laughs> you know, right? there's something that took place that, you know, that right now doesn't make me feel really good about my experience with your organization or my donation uh, to your organization. And we appreciate that. Like, that's awesome. And that's what we hope is the kind of relationship that we're developing with our yeah. donors and investors. That kind of relationship where they can call you, again, call, text, email, whatever it is, carrier pigeon, and let you know that, you know, there's something they need to discuss uh, that they're not happy about. Uh, but then I think there are all of these other uh, areas within our organization uh, where donors are unhappy and we don't necessarily know about it because they uh, they may not be that close to us in terms of our, our relationships. Uh, and so those are folks that, that may be disappointed with the organization because they feel like there's a lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. So how do you know that there are donors frowning about transparency? Uh, they may be frowning about the impact of the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be frowning because they feel like there's a shift in priorities. Uh, mm -hmm. And that effectively communicated the why in terms of mm -hmm. a shift of priorities. Uh, maybe they're over solicited. I'm frowning because. Oh, wow. Okay. Hair on fire moment. You know, I've been getting a solicitation every day this week. And why is that happening? Mm -hmm. uh, again, recognition, personalization in that recognition. And then lastly, the, the other thing that I thought about, and there are probably so many others based on other folks lived experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing that I thought of was the donation process and how easily you know, a potential donor or investor can frown at the process involved in making a donation to the organization. So those are all kind of, of ways that donors and investors can frown, uh, and we may not necessarily know it. Uh, so I think a, a, we have a lot of opportunity to be proactive uh, mm -hmm. to prevent folks from frowning in any of these kind of six categories uh, that I that I just mentioned. Uh, in terms of potential ways that, that make donors unhappy. So fast, this is a fascinating conversation because I, I listening to you, I'm thinking to myself, how often are we going to know? It seems to me like we're going to know in the next gift cycle when a gift isn't made, mm -hmm. right? That, how many people are going to actually speak up and how do we get this dialogue or this information back versus just saying sayonara, they didn't re-up, right? Yeah, well, I, again, I, there are strategies and, and later on in our conversation, I know we'll talk about kind of ways to prevent this from happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of it is really proactive steps from the organization uh, and that involves a lot of, of folks, depending on the particular lane in which may create a, a frown. Uh, but I think we have opportunities to always survey uh, folks that are engaged in our organization. So a good example would be uh, when I was working with the Humane Society of Greater Miami, and we were looking at the different kind of, or not the different, but the giving platform that they were using at the time. And this is going, I mean, I'm going back 15 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. So there weren't a whole lot of platforms available on the market. Uh, 
but we surveyed folks that were using the platform to get their feedback on their experience so that we could understand where there may be roadblocks or hurdles yeah. to re-engaging them or getting them to re-up the next walk cycle. Uh, so there was a lot of great information uh, that, that we obtained through that. And, and organizations can do that now. They know who is giving and, and the ways in which they're giving. So if you have donors that are giving primarily through an online portal, uh, mm-hmm. send them a survey mm-hmm. and, and get the feedback on, on what that user experience was for them. And, and these scenarios, you're not really looking for the data uh, in an effort to change your service provider, but to make sure that you're getting the most out of the bells and whistles that come along with your, yeah. your subscription. Uh, so if you get four people that respond to the survey, great. <laughs> you know, if you get 40 or 400, great. But the, the important thing is that you're creating that avenue for communication and you're getting some sort of feedback. Most folks that have a bad experience will respond <laughs> to that survey. Uh, okay. And so even if you have just one person that responds with an opportunity to improve, uh, it's worth investigating because that one may represent, you know, many more. Okay. So another hair on fire moment that you've already given us, it's, it's early in the day for us here in the West and you've already like set my hair on fire twice this morning. I don't know if I have ever as a donor, I don't know if I've ever been queried or asked. Have you? Um, no, I don't think that I'm, you know, I'm thinking through my experience because many of us, right, we work in this space. We are donors ourselves because, exactly. we are, you know, exactly. we're supporting causes that that yeah. we are passionate about. No, I, I've never been been surveyed, but I, I have had experiences where the organization had they been a little more detail oriented and proactive in their communication uh, would have prevented me from frowning. <laughs> from right, or, or ultimately leaving. Or, or ultimately, yeah, leaving or unsubscribing. Or uh, unsubscribing, wow. Or, or unsubscribing to their, their communication. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll share, you know, one of, one of my kind of pet peeves around, all, around this particular topic and, uh, is when I get an email from an organization thanking me for attending an event that I didn't attend. Oh, so yeah. I get I get oh. that often, you know. I, and and I think the strategy there is is maybe they want me to have FOMO, you know, this <laughs> fear of missing out. I I didn't attend, uh, right. and that's and that's okay. But that needs to come under a different title than thank you for attending our event, you know, other than a gratitude message for attending, which I did not. So so again, you know, messaging uh, and how you do that and how you segment, you know, your lists, I think are Mm -hmm. are super important in order to, you know, prevent a donor from from frowning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that's really interesting. You know, we need to. Uh, drill down in and have another conversation in the not too distant future about how do we query our um, donors? Because I mean, until you brought that up, I was thinking because I'm like you, I mean, when you're in this, when you're in this environment, you make a lot of donations. They're not super huge donations, but they are active. Right. And I, for the life of me, Tony, I don't think I have ever been surveyed. Um, and that is somewhat shocking. Um, so we need to we need to explore this because what an incredible opportunity! What an incredible opportunity! Um, yeah. So as, as we're planning future shows right here live, <laughs> <laughs> let's get back to the topic at hand. So when we find out somebody's you know frowning or they're cranky or maybe they're disappointed, which you know is like the mother's ultimate weapon. When a mother says, I am disappointed in you. (laughs) Oh, that's like a dagger to the heart. (laughs) And somebody says, I am disappointed in your organization or I'm unhappy. How do we get around this? Because we can't always solve a problem or redirect like programming or or do something that's gonna make it right. 
Mm -hmm. what, yeah, what no, is it, that? Yeah. It, 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 that's very true, Julia. So I think the important thing in, in that scenario is to listen, create an opportunity for a conversation to take place, not an email exchange, not a text exchange, but okay. I hear you and, and I want to hear more. Let's schedule a time to chat or meet for coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, and don't be shy about it as the executive director or CEO or development professional, whomever is owning that relationship or needs to be a part of uh, that conversation, just don't shy away from, you know, the, the difficult conver conversations. Uh, it gives you a terrific opportunity to, dis you know, display transparency. Uh, it gives you a terrific opportunity to build trust. Uh, and again, folks want to be seen and heard on their good days and on their bad mm -hmm. days. So yeah. when a donor reaches out to you on a bad day, they want to be seen and heard. And so create the opportunity for, for that to take place. You know, I've made plenty of mistakes in my fundraising career, and I've had to have conversations with folks that I disappointed for whatever reason. Uh, and so just own it, have the conversation. I can tell you in most of those scenarios, not all, but in most of them, the way in which I handled that frown built my credibility and my trust with that organization in a way in which it would have never evolved had that frown not happened. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, that's wisdom of the ages for no matter what you do. Right. I think there's a valor to standing up and saying, I made a mistake. You know, I'm working as hard as I can and I don't always do it right. And this occurred and, you know, I'm sorry, or we can do better or whatever, um, or this is the resolution. And um, I think for me, Tony, and I, I don't want to like, you know, politicize this, but I think we've become um, a society in the last 10 years. It's all about winning, right? It's like in order to move forward, somebody has to lose as opposed to saying, you know, we can be more fluid and, um, you know, somebody in a conversation doesn't have to be the one that's right. And, and somebody else has to be the one that's wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a dynamic that I feel like, or maybe an art that we, we've kind of lost, right. The collaboration piece. Yeah. I mean, I, I think generally speaking that that's very true. I think that we, we always have an opportunity to kind of take the approach that everyone can get across the finish line. It's not yeah. winning. It's not winning or losing. Everyone has an mm -hmm. opportunity to get across the finish line. Mm -hmm. Some folks will get there faster than others, but I think it's our responsibility to help everyone understand how they can get across the finish line. Yeah, I love that. And I think that's a great way to put it. I think that's a great way to put it. I, I, I love that you said that. Um, and I think that's really, really important. So we, we have this finish line and, and we haven't been able to get some of our donors rowing in the same direction or understanding how we're working um, and they get really cranky and, and that frown starts to become anger or we're going to pull back or whatever. Who gets involved with this? Like, how do we, you know, that whole thing, well, I need to speak to your manager. <laughs> I mean, how do we deal with this, right? <laughs> Everyone's just pressing zero for the operator to get me to somebody, right? Uh, <laughs> exactly. Well, it's kind of, it's true. It's it, is, true. it is true. I think, it, I think it depends on the scenario. What is the circumstance in which this donor is now frowning? Uh, okay. Was it the process for making the donation? Well, okay. then it probably, you know, solving this then involves you know, IT and the development officer, right? Gotcha. Uh, so in terms of how we solve it, it may involve many different people within the organization. Mm -hmm. If it's messaging, right? I'm, I have a frown because I'm disappointed with, you know, with your impact. Well, maybe our impact is great. And we just haven't done a really good job of communicating what it is. 
Uh, so now we need to involve marketing and programs so that marketing is getting the information, you know, and, and looking at how we're communicating the impact with, with our donors. Uh, so my, my initial feeling is always that, that conversation, I hear you, I want to learn more, because of course, we always want to be better at what we're doing. Uh, yeah. That conversation, I believe, needs to happen with whoever has the strongest relationship with that okay. individual. So, you know, it, that may be the CEO, depending on the level of giving. Uh, mm -hmm. It may be, you know, the, the development assistant. If it's somebody, you know, we're responding to someone's challenge with making a donation on an online portal. And that's not to minimize those contributions. We just have to think of bandwidth and roles within the organization and how we allocate time to respond to uh, these inquiries that, that provide us an opportunity to do better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's um, an interesting thing to, you know, have that have that sit down internally to, to, to determine what's going to be the best course of action. Um, and I've got to believe it's the source, uh, the source of the, the answer is the source, right? If it's something that you're like, oh my gosh, we can solve this. We're going to do this, this, and that, that's going to be one group or type of person, but maybe it's something that can't be solved, right? Maybe it's something that, you know, we started this program and I know you're unhappy with us, but we're going to continue on with this program because we figured that, or we feel that it serves our mission. Um, because sometimes it's intellectual or philosophical. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not just performative, right? I mean, it's actually like I don't think you should be serving that community, um, and that's a tough deal. Yeah, no, that that is tough, and and I think you know as you started the show and and we talk about what's been going on you know, in Florida and, and you know, in, in the Carolinas and just what's going on with weather in, in many places, a lot of organizations have to kind of shift their mission and find mm -hmm. themselves doing things in these communities that they historically didn't do. Uh, so again, we have an opportunity to be proactive to prevent frowns from occurring and how we communicate the why around all of that. And you're right, a current donor may say, I don't buy into that. That's not mm -hmm. why I contributed. And then you need to you need to be willing to say, thank you so much for you know your contribution. We have appreciated our journey with you. You know, and, and let them make their decision. Sometimes there's just nothing you can do. Right. And, and you just need to let them move on. Uh, and again, that's why, you know, we have a pipeline. That's why, you know, it's, you know, we have a, a fundraising cycle, it's, you know, so that we're not reliant heavily on, you know, current donors, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if, if in fact something comes up and, and there's a need for them to move on and, and support mm -hmm. another organization. Again, when we talk about the sector, we want to make sure that even if a donor is leaving our organization, we do the best we possibly can to make sure they feel good about leaving so they're not completely turned off around giving and philanthropy uh, for the future. You know, the great uh, Terry Axelrod, the, the woman who started raising more money and then it became Benavon, uh, taught me this great phrase. And I think about it. I do think about it every once in a while. And it's bless and release. Yes. Meaning like you know, thank you, like exactly what you said, you know, thank you for, for being of service to our organization, to our community, whatever. And, um, you know, you, you have done a lot and you mean a lot. And we hope that you can find another relationship that is as meaningful and, and uh, continues to do the, the good work that you, you know, you've started. And I think you're right. This is a, this is when we have to get out of our own way and realize that this is a bigger issue than just our organization, that we don't want somebody with uh, resources to leave our community, right? We want them to continue on. But what happens if it's such a stress and it's such a, a disharmony, disharmonious issue that maybe there needs to be a refund or 
Like, what does that look like? Does it exist? Help me out with this, Tony. Yeah, so I, this is where I think having a gift acceptance policy for all levels of giving within your organization is super important. Uh, okay. Whether or not you share that with donors is, is another show and kind of, you know, what how we do that. Uh, I think a, a donor at a certain level, you know, there a lot of times there is a donor contract or there is a definitely an understanding that donor understands what your gift policy is. Mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, for things like, like galas, think about, for example, the nonprofits in Florida that may have had a gala planned, that may have had a 5K planned, uh, where there were registrations, where people bought a 10 top, right? Mm -hmm. So what is your refund policy if that event doesn't happen, or if you reschedule it and now it's not a date that's good for, you know, the folks that that bought the table. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, I think that your internal team needs to be positioned with that mm -hmm. kind of information so that when folks reach out to them and say, this didn't happen, I, I RSVP for it, you know, I'd like a refund. Uh, that won't happen often, at least in my experience, it hasn't happened often. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it did, having those policies in place that I could refer to uh, certainly helped me feel more empowered and better prepared to have those conversations with folks that, that wanted a refund. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the policies are great as a roadmap. I, I, I admit to being a little bit of a rebel. Sometimes I'm like, I don't care about policy. <laughs> I don't care what it says. You know, you got to do it for the individual. Uh, right. So, you know, again, the policy is great. It, it needs to, you know, you need to have kind of the guardrails and, and the roadmap for your team and 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 all of that and, and to have that available for larger donors. Uh, but you got to think about, all right, well, if I don't refund that $250 for the gala that got canceled because this attendee asked for it, what, what does that mean for me down the road for potential engagement and larger gifts from this, yeah. this individual? So again, which, you know, we, we always have to accept that there's a lot of nuance in this work. I mean, right. we're, we're talking about individuals and, and relationships and, you know, everyone's different. Um, so just, you know, have a policy, but accept, you know, the nuances and 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 how that individual may react if you say no to to a refund. But I have given refunds when asked. Uh, I would say more times than not. Actually, I'm struggling. Really? To, yeah, I, I think I'm. But most of my refund experience has been around event related activities. Okay. And for whatever reason, someone reached out and asked for, for a refund. Uh, I, I have never in my experience had to refund a large gift yeah. because that individual felt like there was mission drift or they weren't pleased with, yeah. you know, the impact results or, or something. Yeah. I, I've been on a board where that was a, a challenge. It was a naming right. Um, something that was named a physical structure on a campus and then there was uh, some disharmony about a program, program of service mm -hmm. that had been launched that was new and different. And the donor who had funded um, a building didn't agree with it, even though the programming wasn't going on in the said building. Mm -hmm. But it created such a problem. And, and at the time, this organization didn't have a robust uh, gift policy, nor had they done an MOU or any type of um, structured document, legal document for this naming right of a, of a building. And so it was a tough lesson because it involved so many things that, um, to your point, you know, would have helped everyone if it had been thought of up front. And so uh, super tough, super, super tough lesson for everyone. And, and, you know, I think too, for the donor, um, they had to just really be anguished over this whole problem too, right? I mean, they, they didn't want their name drugged through the mud and, you know, spoken about their gift in a certain way. And so, sure. 
you know, I mean, it goes both ways. This has been fascinating. I have really enjoyed this conversation, Tony. And, and I want to say thank you for always on Fundraisers Friday, giving us a different look into how fundraising works, how we as a sector need to be thinking about fundraising, how we need to be thinking about being a fundraiser and what that looks like and how we navigate this very specific job and responsibility. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancy. Another big shout out of thanks needs to go to our presenting sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. Tony, you always give me so much to think about um, at the end of the week. And sometimes I think we should have started you on Mondays uh, because it, it kind of gives me a lens for uh, for the future. But I'm, I appreciate Fundraisers Friday because I feel like I have a couple days to think about the things that we've discussed and, and the, the different lens with which you've presented. And so thank you very much. Well, I'm always so honored to to be here and share this time with you, Julia, and and just you know, it's just sharing my experience and and as you say, the the way in which I view uh, this work and and the sector, I just love it so much and uh, and just so grateful for all of the folks that that make this their life passion. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, I I can witness to you, Tony, that I know for us without a doubt. I live a charmed life because of nonprofit service. You know, the people I will never know, right? I will right. never know. But I mean, they are doing things in my community, my region, my country um, that make life better for us all. And uh, so it is truly, truly humbling. And it's important that we recognize the role of fundraisers um, in our country because they are that that oil in the engine. And so really, really important. Well, hey, everybody, as we end each and every episode, we leave you with this message. And it's simple, but it's really complicated at the same time. <laughs> and it goes like this, to stay well, so you can do well. Thank you, Tony.